Today we're starting Steps of Faith, Session 2, and we're looking at four spiritual disciplines. We start today with the discipline of fasting. Now, if you've missed Session 1, the introduction explains what a spiritual discipline is, why Christians need to do spiritual disciplines in their daily walk with God. What is fasting? How often do you think fasting is mentioned in the Bible? By my count, there are 77 biblical references to fasting. Does that surprise you? Despite so many references, fasting is not a frequent subject in pulpits, conversations with Christians. And this may be due to the typically private nature of fasting. Though it may be done cor corporately as a body of believers, like it was in Acts 13, verse 2, fasting shouldn't be evident to others. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 16 to 18. So it's possible that Christians around us fast more than we realize. But could the, the, the main reason be that fasting is seldom taught because fasting is seldom practiced. So, should Christians fast today? When Jesus was asked why his disciples never fasted, he replied, quote, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Matthew 9, verse 15. This was the understanding of Christians in the book of Acts, who reported fasting both in chapter 13 and chapter 14. Church history reveals that since the New Testament days, followers of Jesus have engaged in fasting. There is much more that we could say about fasting. Fasting looks different for many different believers. Some will fast for a day, three days, a week. And some have even fasted for as long as 40 days, like Moses and Jesus did. Fasting may be all foods and liquids, although generally speaking, it's simply food which is not partaken of. What are the biblical reasons for fasting? Well, for a specific prayer request. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah fasted for a specific prayer. Secondly, to seek God's guidance. And again, Acts 13 and chapter 14 reference fasting for this reason. To minister to the needs of others. Isaiah 58. To prepare yourself for the work of God. That's what Jesus was doing when he fasted in the wilderness. To experience a deeper fellowship with God. Luke 2, verses 36 to 38. And finally, to be victorious in a season of temptation. Before we leave the, the, the topic of fasting, I want to uh, give you an assignment. I would ask that you spend a period of time this week fasting with a particular purpose in mind. 
Use your hunger to remind you of why you're taking this time. Focus in on God. Focus in on prayer. Ask God to do something special. Then we come to the spiritual discipline of simplicity and encouragement to live a quiet life. And by the way, this is a BIC core value. Let me read what the BIC uh, core value states. We value uncluttered lives, which frees us to love boldly, give generously, and serve joyfully. The Thessalonian Christians had lost their joy. Peace evaded them, and their hope for the future had all but vanished. Many stopped working, allowing idleness to permeate their ranks. Others had fallen into a state of restlessness and gossip. What was the problem? What agent was so powerful and mighty that it had the ability to discourage and sway these early Christians away from what Christ had called them to do? To live for him and to anticipate his victorious return. We should note that seldom did the Apostle Paul panic over any news of the growing pangs of the early church. He understood that the Christian life was filled with ups and downs. However, the struggle that was brewing within the Thessalonian church was enough to capture his attention. False beliefs were creeping into the church. The Thessalonian believers were known throughout Asia Minor for their faith, their hope, and love. And yet, they had allowed a degree of false teaching to persuade them to believe something other than the gospel that Paul had presented. They had believed the lie that they needed to do something. They had to do something more, something super spiritual that they hadn't experienced before. And I have sadly witnessed this ruined Christian lives, marriages, and families. As a result, the focus of their lives had shifted from God to his promises to the and his promises to the unstable ideas of false prophets. Their minds were no longer, longer firmly set on Christ and his infinite ability. Instead, they had fallen victim to anxiety when it came to the subject of the believer's resurrection. Questions plagued them. Had the resurrection taken place? This was a question in the Thessalonica church. Had they missed it? Paul calls them to live simply, to be satisfied, and to be diligent. The Christian life is not complicated. But when we allow fearful thoughts to invade our lives, we suddenly find they turn into struggles. God's wisdom is sure, un complicated and unwavering. He never meant for the Thessalonians to be captured by doubt or the frantic pace of their society. Instead, the Lord wanted them to learn to live simply, 
to be satisfied with what they had and to be diligent in their work for the Lord. In an effort to refocus their attention on the things of God, Paul admonished these believers to, and I quote, make it their ambition to lead a quiet life and not to worry about missing the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Living a simple life means to live an uncluttered life. It means that simplicity is a rare pearl. And it brings freedom to our lives. So, should you practice this spiritual discipline this week, I have an assignment for you. In the consciousness of the things which we are attempting to push God to the margins, take time to spend with Him. If your life is one of worry, wanting, or work, learn to rest in God. Our new projects or owning the next toy or concern for something crowding God out, try to identify that Satan's attempting to use this to push God aside and work at eliminating that instead. Seek the simple, unfettered life. Our next spiritual discipline is the spiritual discipline of fellowship. And again, this is a BIC core value. This is what they say. We value integrity in relationships and mutual accountability in an atmosphere of grace, love, and acceptance. An old story is told of a preacher who visited a man from his flock who had not attended church in some time. The preacher gently knocked on the man's door and was invited into his home. The stray parishioner gestured for the preacher to take his seat next to the fire in his fireplace. After a few moments, without a word being said, the, the preacher picked up a fireplace poker and took one of the logs that was burning in the fire and moved it off by itself to the side. After a few moments, the fire from that log was extinguished. The flame had kindled down, and was no longer apparent. Eventually, the log ceased to glow at all. Oh, the coal, the coal, the log remained on the hearth, but it was cold. After a few moments, the preacher took the poker moved the log back on the fire, and in no time, the log began to burn again with brightly glowing embers. The preacher rose from his chair, put on his coat and hat, and prepared to exit the man's home. 
Just as the preacher reached for the doorknob to let himself out, the wayward man spoke his first words of the evening. Nice sermon, preacher. I'll see you on Sunday. The moral of this story is that Christians need one another to stay on fire for God. What is the biblical definition of fellowship? This word is found in Acts 2, verses 41 and 42. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. These words were penned by Luke when the church was in its infancy. From the very dawn of Christianity, God's people were continually devoted, devoting themselves to fellowship. The the immediate context of Christianity is community and continual devotion to the village of Christ's followers. Now, I know this is a difficult time that we're living in. And I know that online services, as good as we might produce them, are not the same as meeting in person. Friends, I want to share with you that we all need fellowship, even in these days. And you can fellowship with one another by FaceTime, Zoom, or just picking up the phone. If that's all that you have, picking up the phone and talking with one another. Paul stated how fellowship was ingrained in the very nature of Christianity when he stated in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2-3, we always thank God for all of you, and pray for you constantly. And we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, fellowship is intertwined in those verses. What are the benefits of fellowship? Well, first of all, spiritual growth. Fellowship in its purest form acts as a catalyst in the overall equation of spiritual growth. Fellowship provides a petri dish for accountability. The spiritual discipline of fellowship provides the pathway for Christians to grow day in and day out. Here's an example. A small child learns to talk and act like other members of the family due to the close proximity they live in. This closeness helps from the, from the child to learn by watching and then doing. And the same can be said for God's body. Secondly, it helps with our spiritual formation. Christianity is an imitative faith. The disciplines watched, or sorry, the disciples watched their master. They watched him live out his life, and they began to imitate him. After his death and resurrection, they went out and did what he had done. And we are invited, even commanded, to 
do the same. Finally, fellowship is a daily help and accountability. James 5, 13 to 16 says, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sin, you will be forgiven. How are we to live out Luke's words in Acts 20, where he says, So guard yourselves and God's people. We live them out in community. And fellowship is vital to sharing God's word with others. We come to the spiritual discipline finally in in this segment of journaling. In his chapter on journaling as a uh, spiritual discipline, Donald Whitney explains in detail how to do it. Let me share some of his ideas with you. Whitney's idea of the exercise is worth repeating. It's an introduction to what he goes on to explain. And I quote, A journal is a book in which a person writes down various things. As a Christian, your journal is a place to record the works and ways of God in your life. Your journal can also include an account of daily events, a diary of personal relationships, a notebook of insights into Scripture, and a list of prayer requests. It is where spontaneous devotional thoughts, or lengthy theological musings can be preserved. A journal is one of the best places for charting your progress on the other spiritual disciplines and for holding yourself accountable for your goals. So what are the reasons to journal? First of all, it's a better awareness of yourself. This is for the purpose of healthy self-examination, not simply self-absorption. If we write down how we reacted to an event, a piece of news, a difficulty in a relationship with someone, then we can better see ourselves for where we truly are, for our attitudes and our motives. Secondly, it's a time we we can journal during a time of crisis. A spiritual journal, journal can be especially helpful when we're going through a particular difficult time. Susan Hunt's True Women contains the story of one woman for whom keeping a journal was an important anchor. She was married to an alcoholic husband, and throughout her trials, her church wisely advised her and gave her every kind of practical help. The elders worked vigilantly and valiantly with her husband, and were to her shepherding. They helped her financially until she could get a job. They explained things to her children. They prayed for and with them. And her journaling helped her make it through her crisis, especially as she would read back and see 
where God had showed up. Thirdly, journaling helps meditate on the scriptures. Fourthly, it helps our prayer life. And it helps us to remember. If you are practicing this spiritual discipline of journaling this week, I encourage you to keep a journal. Write down your thoughts on Scripture. Write down what you feel God is saying to you and record your prayer requests and see how God has used that to help you. Well, this concludes session two of Spiritual Disciplines. Uh, Next session, we'll be looking at four more spiritual disciplines, beginning with the spiritual discipline of study.